Um, thank you very much for coming back, uh, that you didn't get lost uh, in the vortex of Berlin. <laughs> I'm uh, happy to introduce now the next panel, Across and Within Right-Wing Extremism, Investigation and Interferences. And we are, we are a wonderful crowd of speakers, Matthias Gardel, Richard Gebhardt, and uh, Janet Janza, Janet Janza, and Janet Janza, that is uh, uh, represented by one Janet Janza, but they are actually three. <laughs> and, and one is on the audience uh, infiltrating this conference. Um, I also want to introduce the moderator of this uh, panel, Christina Lee. Uh, she is the head of the, ambas uh, head of the ambassador network for ostwriter.org and also freelance writer and researcher covering the politics of migration and the American and European right wing. She is also co-founder of the website migrationvoter.com uh, that is tracking the role of migration in the election. And at the same time, she is also a lecturer on subjects like international journalism, uh, refugees uh, for coll college students. And I also want to thank Ostwriter a lot because uh, they are among our collaboration partners. So they have been also contributing in spreading the verb <laughs> about this conference. So um, I leave now uh, to these wonderful people, the continuation of this conference, and I will also come back at the end for a little announcement for what is coming next, so please don't leave immediately. And uh, I also want to remind you to subscribe our newsletter, uh, since uh, it's great to be in touch with our wonderful community. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tatiana. Um, when I first got invited to moderate this panel, I was, of course, very interested looking at the guest list. And when we talked about the topic of infiltration, the first thing that had to come to my mind was an old book by Kurt Vonnegut called Mother Night. And I don't know if any of you have ever read it before, but it is basically about a um, playwright that's living during the Third Reich. And he is approached on a park bench and asked whether he's willing to spy for the United States. And the way that he's going to do this is that he's going to partake in radio programs and broadcast, and using carefully placed coughs, he will give critical information that will help the Americans to win the war. So he agrees to do so. And while he's doing it, he's giving Nazi propaganda hate speech and becoming one of the most famous orators in Germany. But he's always able to keep very distance from the things that he's doing because he knows secretly he's actually working for the other side. And at the end of the war, he is called on trial for war crimes. He is considered one of the top Nazis in Germany. And he is um, looking for someone that will bail him out. Turns out he can't find these CIA officers anymore. He can't find any evidence that he actually did it. And he starts to question his own sanity, whether he actually really made this up. Was he, in fact, ever really infiltrating? Was he ever really um, part of the good side? Or was he trying to justify his own actions and stay distanced from them by making up this elaborate story? And so even though that um, book is not really related to any of the things that <laughs> our guests have done, I still think it raises some interesting questions that are sort of relevant for our panelists, um, such as what are the actual effective forms of resistance? Is it most effective to get in there or to stay distanced? Who are we willing to collaborate with when we undertake to resist? Are we willing to just go with anyone that helps us meet our goals? Or do we actually end up putting ourselves into situations where we are collaborating with people that are just as evil as the ones that we're fighting? And most importantly, when you get close to evil, when you try to infiltrate it, when you try to infiltrate these movements, do they in any way end up infiltrating you? Or is that the necessary thing that we need to do is to allow ourselves to be infiltrated by other people, to get as close to the enemy, to recognize that dehumanizing and othering the enemy is exactly what they want us to do. I think similar to what Mr. Davis was discussing. So these questions are really important and more important now than ever. The stakes literally could not be higher, especially from the three countries where our guests are from. In Sweden, this weekend they'll have an election. The Swedish Democrats, a party with neo-Nazi or fascist roots, is 
poised to gain 20% of the vote, something that will change Sweden's self-image, but also certainly change the policy making and the uh, politics of that country for years to come. In Germany, I'm sure I don't have to remind anyone here what we've been witnessing in the past couple weeks, where neo-fascists took to the streets of Chemnitz, beating Chemnitz in Saxony, beating up people of color in a way that was broadcast all over TV, but anyone who has been in this field or paying attention has known that this has also been going on for years, whether it's the National Socialist Underground, whether it's the implication that the police have been infiltrated by the far right and are assisting them in their aims, or whether it's the rise of the Alternative for Germany party, the AFD, aimed with, armed with their um, street crew, Pegida. And in Slovenia, just today, I believe, the former, president, um, or former presidential candidate Andrei Sisko was arrested after a video showed him as the leader of an armed militia that's hunting people on the streets, searching for illegal immigrants in a uh, clandestine operation that's also going on in Czech and in Slovakia. So our guests are very well poised to give us some insight into these movements. So let me introduce who we have. We have Matthias Gardel the Professor of Comparative Religions at Uppsala University in Sweden. He has worked on numerous different topics, including um, African-American religious nationalism, occult fascism, political Islam, racist serial killers, um, and something I found very interesting was that he was a witness at the trial of Anders Breivik, the Norwegian terrorist, and also had the opportunity to speak to him in interviews. We also have Richard Gebhardt, who is a journalist and political scientist working out of Köln. He publishes in periodicals such as Jungle World, Sight Online, and many others. And he has a recent book that has just been published called Fausta Fanen Fankulturen, which looks at the role of um, fascism and hooliganism. And as well, he's a protagonist in a new film that's out, which is available online, which is called uh, Inside Hugiza. And finally, we have one out of four prominent Janis Janzas. <laughs> We have um, the one sitting next to me and also one in the audience. Janis Janza is also the name of the ex-prime minister of Slovenia from the SDS party. And he works on legal aspects of art, uh, art politics and the political imaginary and recently ran for politics in Slovenia this year. So these are very different fields, different countries, and all of our guests use very different techniques to undermine and explore the far right, which they're going to get into in um, small sessions. But the thing that they have in common is that they all got up close and personal in infiltrating the far right and got close enough to touch these people, which I think is where you have to be a little bit concerned. How close to the fire can you get without getting a little bit burned? We will have brief presentations by each of them. And at the end, uh, we're not brief, 25 minutes about, and at the end we'll have a chance for a discussion among ourselves, and then we will uh, also answer questions from the audience. So we'll start first with Matthias, and looking very forward to hearing what you have to say. <laughs> Thank you. Should I... Thank you. It, it is actually quite concerning, Sunday's election, it's not only the fact that the Sweden Democrats may be the third, second, or even largest party in Sweden, and it's not only the fact that it has National Socialist roots, it's still populated by National Socialists, and, but, but I think the, most, the fact that it's most of concern to us is um, the way that other parties have adopted their talking points on their agenda. So I think it's a very crucial election coming up now. Anyway, I'm very happy and honored to be invited to share with you some of my experiences from doing fieldwork among radical nationalists. Um, I'm, as you said, professor of, in the history of religion, which is also an anthropological discipline, uh, and have for some 30 years now uh, explored various radical, the intersections of religion, politics, of, and racism in, in uh, quite distinct political fields. I did my PhD on the Nation of Islam, which is a radical black nationalist movement of becoming gods and goddesses. And I was the first scholar invited since Eric Lincoln, a black sociologist of religion and good friend of Malcolm X, did his study in the late 50s. And so far, I've uh, been the only white devil, as they 
define whites, uh, allowed inside the nation of Islam. When I did that study from the late 80s till the mid 90s, I discovered links between the nation of Islam and the Ku Klux Klan, the American Nazi Party, which you see there, and the white Aryan resistance. That intrigued me that much, uh, returned to the state and, and did a comparative study of black and white religious nationalism, focusing on a lot of things, but also on the United Separatist Front, which is a multiracial uh, organization of separatists that are united in their convictions that they don't want to hang out together. Doing that, I discovered a world beyond the KKK, a more radical world of religious, Ariosophic white racists, such as uh, the Aryan nations and Christian identity. I stayed with them for quite a long time. Actually, I returned to do this fieldwork, it became three years or so. Hanging out with them, with racist pagans, Odinists, occult national socialists, Satanists, and doing that, I also discovered a new military tactics that was on the rise, the so-called leaderless resistance tactics that originated from their realization that their organizations are far too visible, too easy to infiltrate by government authorities, anti-racist organizations. So if they want to launch violence, they need to skip the organized scene of, of white racism and go underground, dress like you guys do, don't openly flag with their political sympathies, and kill in one-man cells, one-man armies. So I did a series of studies of those, including Anders Bering Breivik, whom you mentioned. Uh, did another study on Peter Mangs, who is so far the most successful of Swedish r lone wolf race warriors, operated under the radar of the police for almost a decade in Malmö, in South Sweden, um, launching what he called a low-intensive war on terror on multiculturalism by shooting to death black, Roma, and Muslim Swedes, killing at least three, almost killing another 17 before he got caught. That brought me into another study <laughs> of the correlations between organized and unorganized political violence. And I did a focus on anti-Muslim, anti-Roma violence. And I don't know if you're familiar with what's happening in Sweden, but when it comes to violence against Muslims, you should know that 59% of all mosques in Sweden have been exposed to physical assault. 67% have been threatened, and it's only one mosque out of ten that's never been assaulted, either physically or, or by threats of any kind. So the situation is quite problematic. Doing that study, I realized that I need to go back to, to, to do an ethnography within uh, the radical nationalist landscape. I did it in Sweden. It was more tricky, and I'm, I'm, I'm still doing this. It's, it's a bit more tricky uh, because they already know from my books, from my political engagements, what I think and what I believe. So I do not infiltrate. Uh, I'm very open with, whom I am, with who I am, where I stand politically, why, I'm, why I want to hang out with them and doing interviews with them, so I don't valraf which is a verb in Swedish, to do wall roughing. And I have a great respect for Valraff. He made amazing studies, but to me, ethically, it's better to be open. So I give them my personal phone numbers, my home address, the small code you use to get into the apartment complex, and everything like that, and I hope that that will prevent some counter violence. I use the concept radical nationalist landscape to connote the whole milieu from the Nordic resistance movement, which is a national socialist movement, over the alternative for Sweden, who right now had a big meeting at downtown Sweden with the leading fascists of Europe, 
and they are right now eating at Opera Cellaren, which is a very prestigious, high-class uh, restaurant, celebrating their coming victory uh, over the alt-right and the Sweden Democrats. And what I want to try to share with you here, who, who was supposed to give me a note if I'm speaking too long? Uh, I, s I want to start out with challenging the idea of what we deal with is right-wing extremism. I think that this is seriously a mistake, more due to conventions or theoretical laxity than uh, empirically sound observations. As they say in this milieu, it's, it's a big distinction between the right-wing and the white-wing. Fascism is more to be seen as a monoculturalist extremism of the center that comes from those who believe that they define the proper folk of the nation. They adopt elements from both the right and the left, as seen in the slogan they use, neither left nor right but forward. They would stress elements from the right, like God, tradition, nation, patriarchy, social Darwinism, in egalitarianism, but they will also use concepts taken from the left, such as white working class issues, the need to care for white education, for white elderly poor, for white homeless people. They might have environmental concerns. They are all into vegetarianism, organic food, they talk about climate change. When I made interviews with the Nordic resistance movement, they really stressed the socialist aspect of national socialism. They tell me that they want to re-nationalize what neoliberal politicians have privatized, sold out. They want to take back public transportation public education, public uh, medical and health care. They want six hours labor day. They want a lot of these things that we normally associate with the left. So I think we should keep that um, in our memory because if we talk about them in a way that they do not talk about them when they spread their propaganda, those who are unfamiliar with what they say we say, we realize that there's a big difference between what is said about these guys and what they say that they want. We need to take them seriously. And one way of doing that is to entering their world, to stay with them, to socialize, to hang out, to do what I call a study of everyday fascism. When you do that, you're going to experience, like Daryl did, that this milieu is also populated by a lot of ordinary folks that you might find a lot of things in common with. They do like their children. They actually love them. They might engage in football, the European definition, of course, um, music, art, motorcycles. You can have a lot of things in common. They're not incarnations of evil as they have sometimes been portrayed. You could not defeat National Socialism with garlic. It's not that simple. You need to face the fact that historically, when National Socialism arose here in Germany or fascism in Italy, it was supported by millions ordinary Germans and Italians who looked themselves in the mirror, considered themselves to be good and decent citizens, who engaged to support fascism, national socialism, that participated in the genocidal slaughter, and still considered themselves to be good and decent citizens. I think that's an important thing. So I want to I don't know, how, how much time do I have? <laughs> 12 minutes. Okay, so, so I, I've, I'm talking this fast only because I don't have a... a it should have been good with a, with a watch or something. Somewhere. I, ju I just want to... Um, this is also interesting because 
It also shows that they are now going into the idea of community building. They are banding together. This is by inspiration from the US. So they move together. They want to find those uh, places where people have left already in the process of urbanization. They go back to the countryside. They want to form the majority in, in, in small communities. They want to homeschool their children. Uh, they want to take that power locally. They want to be build islands in the stream and then connect these islands with each other. And that's another interesting topic, I think, uh, worthy of, of exploring. Anyway, I want to share right now. Uh, now my notes are gone. Um, some thoughts about my current research, with, which focus on the affective dimension of radical nationalism. National socialism as an ideology of love, as I will explain later, and talk a little bit about nostalgia, which I think is key to understanding this, this milieu. Um, they <coughs> I think should also realize that the politics is not only built on rational reason. It has a very strong affective dimension. What happened after the so-called free world's victory in the Cold War was the global expansion of the current market economical system that became normalized to such an extent that many people have difficulties of envisioning another society, another system beyond the current one, as if this was the natural order of things. So mainstream left and right have sort of come to the conclusion that we have arrived at the final destination, as lyricized by Francis Fukuyama as the end of history and the last man. Also the left has abandoned the affective dimension of politics. They do not longer build utopias. They don't offer anything for people to engage in, something that makes the heart bump harder, something that puts the blood on fire. That aspect of politics have been left to the fascists, and I think that creates a very dangerous situation. If you look at their worldview, you will see that it's quite apocalyptic. They do believe that they are now facing a white genocide. What they also talk about in terms of the great replacement. They say that by a conspiracy, typically orchestrated by Jewish people who have opened the borders for a flood of racial aliens, predominantly Muslims, to invade our countries, it's a, uh, it's a scheme that will replace the aboriginal allegedly ar aboriginal whites of Europe and the United States with racial aliens. And hence, the Charlottesville idea, you will not replace us. That's a sort of rallying cry. And it's really turning people on. And despite the fact that Islam has been one of Europe's many religions for 1,300 years. And Muslim people, for as long, has part have participated in building the history we call European and Western history. Islam and Muslims are today contrafactually construed as aliens to Europe and Muslims and our lands. And they need to be fought and this is launched in emotional language and nostalgical terms as uh, a new, the need for a new reconquista. What then is nostalgia? What are the pleasures and pain of nostalgia? The word itself has an etymology that in Greek uh, combines nostos, homecoming, with algia, pain and was originally used uh, to describe the lethal depression soldiers who fought in foreign lands felt when they decided to go home. Uh, people who really died, uh, diagnosed with nostalgia. 
when in the late 1800s they discovered that it was in fact not a legal disease, it merged with the romantic, national romanticism to connote um, the idea, the yearning, the sentimental yearning for the happiness of a former place and time. This idea was taken up by the movie industry and thereafter the commercial culture, material culture, the retro industry. And when it started to be used politically, it could also, by these means, be used to get people longing for a time and a place that they only have mediated experiences from. We are longing from, for places that we ourselves has not experienced in our own uh, life. And this is key to the Trump, or I don't know if you should call him president, maybe I should say number 46 as they do in black America, because it's not their president, they would say, <laughs> no, 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 he's number 46. Um, the, the idea of make America great again, that construes a vision of a country that was once, but is no longer great. And doing that by projecting the idea of a white nation back into legendary ahistorical times that at the same time erases Native American, Black American, Latin American, Asian American presence from you as history. And this idea, nostalgia, is also the key ingredient when you see now that fascism is returning with a vengeance in Europe, but also beyond its historical heartland. In the, look at what's happening in Russia, in India, in the Philippines, and in Turkey. The same idea of searching for the future through the lens of the past, the keys to a rebirth of past glories and national greatness. greatness. That is exactly the key fascist fact. Uh, factor in this movement. Now, if you look at the literature, lots of people who write about this scene, they would s tell you that this milieu is populated by angry white men who hate. But if you talk to them, they would say that, of course, we're mad at certain things, but we engage out of love, not out of hate. I think love is a stronger political emotion than hate. They say that they engage out of love for their race, for the beauty of white women, for the future of white children, for their love of, of their country, their history, for midsummer and Christmas, or whatever they feel is threatened by the racial stranger's presence in our land. And I think that you need to take both these claims seriously and think about how love and hate might reinforce and recharge each other. Because one of the, if you look at the language of love, one idea in love is that love needs to be, should be reciprocated, right? If you lo love someone, you want that person to love you back. And one of the mysteries of love is that when you find that the person whom you project your love onto might not love you back, doesn't make you quit loving that person and start loving something else or someone else, but you could invest more energy, stay put, trying to convince the object of your desire that you are actually the one worthy of his or her love. National love is this kind of love. It's a love where activists feel that they are, they are the, love, the, the lovers of the nation of the race, or, or the race. Um, they say that we are positive, you know, we're not haters. Look at the enemies, they are the haters. They are anti-fascist. They are anti-nationalist. They are so negative. We are pro, we are Sweden's friends, we are loyal to the white race, or and we love, and they expect the race and the nation to love them back. And when that's not happening, 
they start to invest more time and project the idea of love being returned to future generations. And that's the role that plays by all these small, beautiful white kids that you see dotted all over National Socialist propaganda today. They will experience the time when love is returned. And then you need an explanation for why is love not returned? Why does the nation very often project this as a sort of white woman? white woman. This is a very masculine and predominantly male-dominated world, and, and you have a lot of feminized notions of the nation who now is penetrated by racial aliens. It's a sexualized language, and this is the explanation, that the love that really belongs to me is stopped because she is kidnapped. She is held hostage by race, racial aliens who defile her who rape her, who uh, makes her unclean. And that provides me, as a white activist, with my role known for, from hundreds and hundreds of years of legends. I take up my sword for race and blood and honor, and I go confront the racial aliens to kill off them and rescue that beautiful white woman and then ride off in the sunset. So it's a very romantic notion that goes through this. These are people who consider themselves to be the heroes, the real good guys. And if you really want to confront what's happening now, you need to confront that. You need to understand, I think, that political engagement is between various groups who have different ideas of what good society looks like. And you need to fight that fight. You need to embrace yourself that way. And I think, I think we have not so much time. I think that fascism is returning with a vengeance. We are sailing right into the storm. We can already sense the cold wind, the wetness, the rain is coming. Those of us who can pass by the whiteness of our skin, by our previous history of non-political engagement or anything, will adjust to these storms, see comfort from the wind, repeat the words that makes the wind stronger. Those of us who cannot pass, those of us who are already politically burned, who have black skin, who are Muslim, who cannot go away, will be hit by this force. And I think we need to look also, when we're sailing, we know that it could change. We could try to steer in some other direction. But if we are sailing right into this, and if fascism now is reaching for the powers of the state, this is exactly what's happening in Hungary, in Poland, in Slovakia, in Czech Republic, in Turkey, in India, in other places. We also need to realize, I think, that fascism historically always have failed. Their idea that good society builds on the principle of likeness, of homogeneity. The birds of a feather think the same. That runs contrary to everything we know about human uh, societies throughout history, throughout space. So I think that if fascism tries to, by the powers of the state, mold the people in the likeness of its ideology, it will be defeated again. So the only meaningful question now is how much blood will it require this time? And I, need, I think we need to, one sentence, need to also look at the horizons of hope, that if fascism come, it will be a resistance. What role will you play in that resistance? And how do we prepare for the time that will come after fascism? Because there will be such a time again. Thank you. Sorry for talking.
Okay. So good evening, Berlin. Thanks for the invitation. I think that the German political culture has reached a turning point, and I will talk about this turning point this evening because I think my main topic, hooliganism, is deeply involved in this kind of turning point. But I will start with some personal remarks because when I first received the invitation to take part at this conference, I suddenly became, to be honest, a little bit nervous and was therefore tempted to cancel. The reason is quite simple. I'm definitely not used to speak English in front of kind of such publics, and I haven't held this kind of lecture for more than seven years. So I have almost no practice in speaking on notation like this today. But when I saw the program of this conference, I was quite sure that my part could complement the other perspectives on the praxis of infiltration because I observed the public protests of the far right for years. So please excuse me for preparing a paper, but I think in uh, that case I will be more uh, pre precise and will not sound like Lothar Matthäus this evening. Uh, I'm not sure if the international audience here can catch the joke, so uh, I hope you don't mind. So, I would like to talk about the influence of hooligans on the shift on the right-wing temporary taking place in Germany. When the journalist and filmmaker Fred Kovac asked me to participate in his film Inside Ogeza, a movie which was released in May, I didn't just see the chance to visit several additional protests, but I also got the opportunity to talk to the activists involved, like one of the founders of the Hooligans Against Salafist. I will explain the name of this group later on. So I'm here to give an insight into the right-wing movements in Germany and will therefore discuss the main thesis of Fred's film. We both think that the public protest and the public response to the first demonstration of Hogeza, which is an acronym for Hooligans Against Salafists, on the 26th of October in 2014, not only sped up the establishment of the patriotic Europeans against the Islamization of the West, which is known as Pegida, which held its first rally in Dresden with 350 participants only one week before. So you see there's a close connection to it. We also believe that the media echo, which was invoked by Hogesa, helped to transform the alternative for Germany, AFD, into an Islamophobic right-wing party, which is the AFD not the latest since the summer of 2015, when Frauke Petri took over the leadership. The political culture in Germany is deeply influenced by a right-wing movement which shows close connections to the AFD, and that's not just in the eastern part of the Republic. Many of the protests I joined during the last four years took place in towns like Cologne, my hometown, or for example Essen, which belongs to the so-called Ruhrgebiet. We have to consider that hooligans do not only support movements like Pegida or Ligida or the merkel Mosweg demonstrations as a part of the security service, but they also have a deep influence, as our film shows, on the organization and the political agenda. The full title of the film is Inside for Geza, from street to parliament, which means that we both regard the AFD as the parliamentary arm of the contemporary right-wing movement, and this movement has been deeply inspired by hooliganism. The next slide, please. Okay, I don't know if you can see this quite clearly. In this picture, you can see supporters of Energy Cottbus after it was clear that they would enter the third league in Germany. They are wearing skirts which resemble the robes of the KKK, so maybe Daryl should visit them and convince them that they are wrong. I don't find uh, that you can find certain kind of pictures in everyday soccer teams, but I found this most um, impressing to see with, what kind of symbolic they work. When the AFD moved into the German Bundestag here in Berlin, Alexander Gauland, one of their leaders, said what he will do with the other parties. We will hunt them down. Wir werden sie jagen. 
It might be a spoiler when I say that at the end of the film, this quotation plays a prominent role after we saw the endorsement of one of the Hogesa founders vote for AFD. But it's quite consequential to draw the line between the behavior of the hooligans on the streets and the representatives of the AFD in the German Bundestag, where discussions are now much more aggressive than before. We will hunt them down. This is not just a rhetorical figure. When you look at the demonstrations in Kandel, for example, a place in Rheinland-Pfalz, where you see where parts of the AFD acted together with members of the identitarian movement or the right-wing hooligans, you can see how aggressive these activists behave, not just against journalists. And after during the last four years, Fred Kovacs and I observed several of these protests and Fred even established a dialogue with parts of a subculture which normally doesn't speak to journalists. To give you an example of the atmosphere, I would like to show you just a trailer, it's not more than two minutes, of Inside Ogeza, and I'm quite sure that you will catch the point even you don't speak German. There will be no other titles now. Polizisten mit so aufgerissenen Augen haben zu den Hurensohn gesagt und haben gesagt, ich hau dir in die Fresse. Ich weiß nicht, wo, in welchem Land wir hier leben, aber dass sich eine Polizei so verhält, die an Silvester so versagt hat. Sie begreifen Fußball tatsächlich als Krieg. als Kampf. Sie verteidigen die alten Werte. Überall gibt es eine Band, die alles zusammenhält. Und das ist in der Hinsicht eigentlich kategorisiert. Weil in der Form getrennt wurde, in der Sache vereint. Und ähm, wie Sex oder besser als Sex? <lacht> Kommt auch an, welchen Sex? Dreckiger Sex? Blümchen Sex? <lacht> ich würde es vergleichen miteinander. <lacht> ne? Und äh, ist definitiv geiler. Definitiv. heute überhaupt gewesen, wenn die Hut nicht auf die Straße gekommen wäre und wenn Pegida nicht auf die Straße gekommen wäre. Die hätte wahrscheinlich die 5% Prozent würde noch nicht mal geschafft. Okay, thank you, Jonas. I think you could see the atmosphere of some of the public protests which we observed, and you can believe me, they are not preparing just for another cultural war, like the cultural war we saw in America or we see nowadays with Trump. They're preparing for civil war. They're preparing to overthrow the government now in uh, Germany. And I think that's a point we must see now, right in the aftermath, uh, after the events in Chemnitz. I would like to speak about the making of Inside the Gaza and our method of infiltration. When I first heard about the hooligans against Salafists in early 2040, I considered it as a joke. The name sounded like it had been invented by the magazine Titanic. It reminded me on fake names like Crittle Hill, fascists inside of the NSDAP. But when I arrived at the central station of Cologne on the 26th of October in 2040, which was, as I have already said, the day when the first public protest of Hogosa took place, I was totally impressed. Members of firms, that's how hooligan groups call themselves, from Dortmund and Essen, which are normally enemies, stood together under the banner in den Farben getrennt in der Sache vereint. I would translate it in divided in colors, but united in the fight. 
There was a massive crowd on this day. Hogeza mobilized 4,500 people to Cologne. Many of them were older males who had been part of this kind of subculture for years. And in this subculture, there exists a myth, the myth of the so-called unpolitical hooligan. One of the most important bands in this subculture, Category C, sings the famous line, football is football and politics is politics. Fußball ist Fußball und Politik bleibt Politik. So there's a long-standing myth of the unpolitical hooligan. I remember when Heiko Maas, now the German foreign minister, said in a TV show that hooligans, by definition, do not act political. In his point of view, they are just keen on fighting inside or outside the football ground and are mostly interested in binge drinking or heavy boozing. Maas repeated the image that hooligans claim to have of themselves as unpolitical football supporters. But if you have a closer look at the history of hooliganism, which was established in England in the late 17th, then you can see that this kind of subculture, which was often regarded as the English disease, was mingled with the far right from the beginning. Next slide, please, Jonas. When you read, for example, Among the Thugs by Bill Buffett, you will realize that not just in Millwall, which is in the southeastern park, uh, part of London, a heartland of hooliganism, the British National Party, or the National Front, was very vivid in this kind of football subculture right from the start. Also, I believe that not every hooligan is necessarily a neo-Nazi. There are still close links up to today. And by the way, I regard Among the Thugs as one of the best books written by an author who infiltrated a subculture. Buffett used to live with them for several years, for, for example. Buffett presents the closest look possible, and this book is still worth reading today. It would be interesting to give you a closer insight into the history of hooliganism in Germany or England, but I'd like to focus myself on the experience during the last few years. Since I've acted as a defender of an anti-racist ultra group at our local club in the western part of Germany, I have many media contacts, and after the demonstration of Hogeza, I received a lot of questions. But I soon realized again that many journalists writing about football are not able to differentiate an ultra from an hooligan. And that's a problem in the media response, for example. One of the exceptions of the rule was Fred Kobach, who was preparing a feature for the German Sportschau. As we talked about the phenomenon, I realized that he was willing to take a closer look at the political impact of this right-wing subculture. Even though there is a younger generation in hooliganism, when we talk about Hogeza, we are talking mostly of older males belonging to the lower or middle classes. And although the heyday of hooliganism was in the 80s, they remain part of the fan scene and since the year 2011, often engage in a fight with anti-racist fan groups over the leadership of the terraces. The younger generation is, by the way, more interested in mixed martial arts and stuff like this. I think you compare, can't compare this with the football subculture in the 80s, but that would be another point. And it is definitely no accident that the hooligans choose Salafist as their enemy image. Both share a certain kind of masculinism, and they share the same archaic habits. The identity of a hooligan is mainly based on masculinism and nationality. They regard themselves as the real defender of their country, and the Salafists share many similar views. So when you listen to them, to the hooligans, you will hear them intone allergies to the fading white male working class culture. This is the same what Donald Trump does, for example, with his blue-collar workers in the south parts of America. Right-wing hooligans consider themselves to be the bulwark for the public voice, which is allegedly oppressed by a you-shouldn't-say-that culture, of course, by the forces by political correctness. They claim to speak on behalf of the silent majority and their moral values. 
And Hogeza indeed put the focus on Islam before the AFD considered it to be a main topic. And after the demonstration in Cologne in 2040, I saw 20 of them in the years later run, I realized an interesting gap. On the, on side, on the one side, the leading figures of the AFD condemned the violence on the street, but when you took a closer look at the discussions on right-wing websites, you could see there was, on the other hand, a remarkable kind of affirmation. The Huls were regarded as the guardians of the public will. And this so-called public will claims to be highly critical, not just on Salafists, but of every aspect of Muslim migration. In my last part, I would like to talk about the method during the shooting of the film. I would like you to know that Fred's movie is some kind of a lowest budget production. He did almost everything on his own and didn't, didn't receive any kind of public sponsorship. So there were several difficulties right from the beginning. But during our work, I got a close look at the state of our political culture. When we went to the demonstration of the right-wing hooligans in 2016 in Dortmund, a demonstration which was dominated by the neo-Nazi scene, a leading police officer made it quite clear that he would not be willing to endanger his colleagues if we were attacked. You are journalists and you know who those people are, he said to us. You have to work on your own risk. Go for it, he added. That's how the freedom of the press is sometimes defended here in Germany. So when we uh, arrived at the location of the protest, we were able to get interviews with Tatjana Festerling, for example, a former leading figure of P the Pegida movement, and Dominic Rösler, one of the founders of Hogesa. This was the man you could see in the trailer, for example. It was quite surprising how close even Freyd was able to get to these activists. He made it quite clear from the beginning that he did not have the intention to make moral justifications. Also, they of course knew that Freyd and I don't share their habits and views. But as they realized that even Freyd knows quite a lot about this subculture and that he's willing just to listen, they gave him interviews and were sometimes even willing to talk with me an author who works for anti-fascist papers since more than 20 years and whom they must regard as their enemy. So I made a really interesting observation. When Fred asks his open-ended questions, the film turns in some kind of a public confession share. It seems to me like they were just waiting for an occasion like this to talk friendly, frankly about their ideas and idols. And so Inside Hogeza contains material that had never been documented on the camera before. And Fred and I had no ambition to convince them. That's the main difference to the approach of Daryl, for example. We only wanted to see who they are, what they think, how they act in their political practice, and what their political impact is. And you can see this impact, for example, in Kandel, where Category C also mobilized to take part in the demonstration. Or look at Chemnitz, where the protests have been formed by hooligan firms. I have to say here as an excurs away from the paper, I prepared this lecture, this paper, three, uh, three weeks ago. And uh, I was finished with that topic because I saw more than 30 of those public protests by Hogeza and their followers, and I felt quite bogged after I went back home from one of these demonstrations. And uh, I thought, uh, I will uh, do something else. I will um, work on political theory, improve my English, or do something useful. But then Chemnitz came. And so I must realize that this kind of right-wing subculture is much more vivid than I had, than, than it would be nice uh, to be. <laughs> so there is danger that the film repeats and doubles, this is a, a remark to the method, but I think it's not uh, unproblematic to talk about uh, infiltration, it just take not more than five minutes. So I think I will uh, make this a difficult point and critique um, at the last point. So there's danger that the film just repeats and doubles the propagandas of the right-wingers, 
and that the filmmakers fraternizes with the protagonist. Would you please show the next slide? You can see those people over there. You, of course, you know many uh, of them after doing such kind of a research personally. And there's some kind of a Stockholm syndrome when you meet them at public pond places. But when you, because when you arrive with them at the public spaces where they're doing their demonstrations, the only enemy that you have as a journalist who is trying to observe them in the middle of this kind of protest is the Antifa. Because most of the, of the time I had difficulties to go away from demonstrations like that because they must regard me as a hooligan. Okay, not by uh, imagine, but uh, they uh, saw me uh, uh, with uh, them in uh, the public sphere. And the danger of fraternization is real. When the film was realized, protagonists like Tatjana Festerling and Dominic Grösler from the inner circle of Pegida and Togesa posted comments which showed that they were more or less delighted. They highly acclaimed the fair approach of the movie and the objective courage. A few days later, a hooligan group posted the film on YouTube, where the movie achieved several thousand views in just two days. So I was very curious what would happen when the film was shown in Leipzig, Verrotterstern Leipzig, a left-wing football club which had been attacked by hooligans too, invited to a screening. At the second nest in Leipzig, I don't know if you could understand second nest, uh, it's uh, quite a funny name. At the second nest in Leipzig were more than 50, mostly young people in attendance, and everyone listened intensive, staying until the very end. So I would end with some conclusions. In our case, we had no intention to change or convince the opposition. We would have regarded this as an illusion in our case. We were just thinking in journalistical terms. First of all, even a neo-Nazi should have the right to be quoted correctly, of course. And secondly, we wanted to show what kind of politics the far-right hooligans support, even because they claim to be unpolitical. We wanted to know why they consider themselves an oppressed minority. And how do you they, and how they react to the cultural and political changes taking place in Germany? From the beginning, it seemed quite clear that Hogesa would be no more than a temporary association, which would soon split. But it also seemed quite clear that Hogesa would work as an amplifier for the movement of the far right. The close contact with the activists of Hogesa, Pegida, and so on, definitely removes the myth of the unpolitical hooligan. The film shows how hooligans still act as an important part of the right-wing movement, I saw Fred, it was the one who was talking how uh, did uh, AfD really become a, a party in the German parliament if the hooligans had not been. He was also in Chemnitz, of course. And the willingness to speak with them, the film shows how hooligans still act as an important part of the right-wing movement, and the willingness to speak with them face-to-face -face enables journalists to get a closer insight to this specific subculture which is normally biased against the media. The hooligans used to call them Lügenpresse, lying press, a term that was frequently used in World War I and also by the Nazi government in the so-called Third Reich. Inside Ogesa makes it quite clear that hooliganism has an important role in the establishment of a right-wing social movement. And therefore, the film shows the underlying nature of the success of the AFD which is also a huge success of right-wing hooligans. And I think, as the events in Chemnitz made clear, this is an important detail which should not be overlooked in the analysis of the great shift to the right seen in Germany today. So thank you very much for your attention. You have been very friendly. So I'm glad we ended on an um, upbeat note, because <laughs> some of the other topics that we were talking about tonight were pretty dark. But now we would have an opportunity to speak just for a few minutes um, in the group with a couple of questions. And I thought maybe we could start talking about a topic that came up in a couple of the presentations, the uh, topic of masculinity. It's not a coincidence that 
everyone here that has infiltrated have been men. You've also infiltrated movements or been part of movements that are dominated by men, and the men tend to be nationalistic and use the image of a man to represent the nation and position themselves usually as people that are protecting women, white women. What do you think the role of masculinity is in, uh, in this field? Do you think that the nation state is inherently a, a masculinist project and that the opposition then must be different than this? Feminist, perhaps? <laughs> So there is, in Slovenia, there is a quota. 35% uh, uh, of candidates, uh, at least 35 po uh, uh, candidates, should be of one of the two uh, sexes. And there were, I think, three or four parties, three or four lists that could not uh, match uh, this ratio. Yeah? And uh, <clears throat> in three cases, it was because uh, the parties could not have f at least 35 women on, uh, on their list. Uh, in one case, it was because they didn't have 35% of, um, of uh, male uh, candidates. Uh, but yeah, the um, political campaign and debates in Slovenia uh, were very much uh, uh, conditioned by uh, this uh, alpha, uh, uh, alpha energy, uh, masculine energy, uh, very much uh, related and uh, concentrated on ego and power and very little on content. No, it's, it's very obvious that even though there are many female supporters of the Radical Nationalist Project. Also, it is uh, very explicitly anti-feminist. And that's not by coincidence. Radical nationalism depends on women doing their role, producing uh, pure children and the future generations. Uh, so I, I think that the, the, the vision of, of fascism is centered on the idea of masculine virility and, and uh, female fertility and, and so they hate uh, the women out, women out of place who fall in love with the wrong people who might be lesbian, who might be anti-racist or occupy spaces in public space where they should be probably at home breathing better. Um, so, so I think obviously if you want to make an effective resistance against that. You need to take an intersectional approach uh, and combine f a feminist, visionary le leftist, I would say, class and, and diverse perspective altogether. Um, you cannot uh, just bow down to, to uh, the conventional rhetoric of them. And that's not the easiest thing to do because what they built on is actually century-old patriarchal norms and values. I focus myself on hooliganism, and hooliganism is by definition a male culture. They regard themselves as soldiers, and I think that masculinism is always a main part of fascist ideology. When you read the famous German book by Klaus Theweleit, for example, it's called Männer Fantasien. So I don't know how to translate it correctly in, in English. Fanta yeah, man fantasies, of course. So I think uh, we must regard this point in uh, every sense. They're just um, groupies in those kind of groups. So I think it might be different in the identitarian movement where Julia Ebma will talk about tomorrow. So I will focus myself here on hooliganism. And I think that even the younger people just have uh, female um, attendance just uh, at, as an accompany. So uh, that's a male culture. And when you see how they perform their bodies, their bodies of 
males who had been workers, had been talking about allergies of the white male working class culture. Those bodies are more or less useless nowadays because of automation, because of digitalization, and so they have to find other public spheres where they can present that kind of uh, masculinism in the terraces of the football grounds, for example, or in the so-called Dritte Halbzeit, the third term, where they make their appointments to having their fights. I haven't seen any woman there since, and it was raised up with hooliganism in the football ground. I knew them since 1980s, so never saw one female hooligan, of course. But then maybe this is the solution that the women have to infiltrate all of these <laughs> fields. But I mean, really, maybe if nationalism is inherently tied up with masculinity, that the only way to break it is to break the patriarchy, and this is the first step. But I want to bring it back more to now a technique question. <laughs> oh, thank you. <laughs> the, um, all of you are doing something which is bringing more attention to the uh, movements that you study. Yeah, this is inherent. And as an organization, host writer works on journalism, and journalism also often operates in this way that you, uh, even whether you infiltrate, if you observe it and expose it, the concept should be that by exposing these negative things that people will be turned off by it and moved away. For example, it's a common strategy in Germany to expose that a movement is secretly anti-Semitic, and this is a way. But now all of these things have kind of been exposed and they don't actually seem to turn people off anymore. And you know, as Donald Trump famously said, he could shoot someone in the middle of, <laughs> of New York City and he would still get elected. The question is, does this still work? Or uh, is there any fear that you're uh, just helping these views to get a wider audience and that there's a tipping point where it doesn't scare people away anymore? So I don't know, my experience talking with people is like my, my, my conclusion uh, is that people are afraid. You know? there, is a, there is some kind of deeply grounded uh, fear uh, because people have their thoughts and opinions and so on. And just to tell you that Grosuple is the place where uh, Yanis Yansha always wins. It's a kind of heart of uh, right uh, wing uh, ideology. And uh, <clears throat> uh, the population is changing there. Uh, but what I wanted to, to say is just there is this moment, dimension of fear that uh, totally strike me. This is one thing. And the other thing is basically elections are uh, totally losing a kind of a representative uh, uh, dimension because uh, in Slovenia this year there were only 52% people uh, voting. So the biggest party, the, 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 the winner, is uh, uh, people who didn't come. It's nearly half, uh, half of it. Just have a look at the AFD in the German Bundestag. They are in the press by scandals every single week. And so it doesn't have any kind of impact. When you look at the polls, they're still very strong now at the moment. And I think we just have to regard, and that's the main interest of myself, in um, laying a focus on hooliganism, for example. I just see that they are talking very rough which is common sense in those kind of public groups and this kind of supporters for the AFD, for example. We have to realize the fact that a significant part of the population, even in Germany, is fed up with mainstream media, is fed up with the official kind of politics, is fed up with the so-called system Merkel. And you have to realize that they do not want just changes or another kind of politics. No, I saw them mingle with the right-wing populists. I saw them mingle with some kind of national democrats, as I saw them in Austritz and Saxony, for example. They do not want to have another kind of migration politics. They want to overthrow the government. They are fed up with Angela Merkel. They're preparing for civil war. And that's a very dangerous situation we have to regard. Chemnitz is just a place, not just a place in Saxony, the third uh, biggest city of, of Saxony. You can find those kinds of ideology, uh, this kind of crisis of the representation in German politics, even in cities like Cologne or in Dusseldorf, for example, the main capital of uh, North Rhine-Westphalia. 
There had been a demonstration by the hooligans rightly after the events in Chemnitz, and they mobilized via Facebook, and um, because of uh, police oppression, they uh, would like to, uh, to, to quit this demonstration. But they met them, uh, the, but they uh, met in the, after, uh, in the late afternoon, and there were more than 200 and people just mobilized during a few hours. There were 4,500 mainly from the western part of Germany in Cologne 2040. So there's a massive crowd, there's a massive rumor, there's an underlying atmosphere, an underlying force in our political culture and we have to regard it. Just look into the internet in the public forums for example. Uh, it's, it's, it's a tough question, and it's a tough question that I constantly come back to when I do that, this kind of studies. Um, I've, I've been, you know, people have been saying that what you actually do when you are, you know, processing their incoherent and contradictory opinions through your intellectual brains, you're, gi you're giving them a history and, and a philosophy that shouldn't have been there uh, as, uh, otherwise. And I think that's wrong, of course. And, and I also got the question when I did a mon uh, monograph on Peter Mangs, this, this lone wolf race warrior. Um, and people were saying, what, isn't that only to give him a sort of heroic, even if anti-heroic status that will attract more people, uh, that will buy into leaderless resistance um, lone wolf operation tactics because of this book uh, and, and of course I've thought that too. The reason for him wanting to speak with me, so many interviews, 10 interviews, 3 hours each in maximum security prison, I got access to all his files, his hidden computers, all his political speeches, I did I moved to Malmö, I talked to everyone in the political milieu including people who support him and all of that and, and what he did, actually, in this, in this war was that he realized uh, that if I, sh if I shoot and kill a black person or a Roma or a Muslim, the police will suspect other blacks, Roma or Muslim, which will stigmatize uh, the community that the victims belongs to further. That in itself will feed uh, media descriptions of on black and black violence, about yet another killing among those who are called immigrants, even if they are born in Sweden, uh, but to parents uh, born somewhere else, as if the, the status of, of being an immigrant could be inherited. But it's, it's a process of racial, racialization that goes on now. And those, you know, media portrayals on, on you know, immigrant crime and, uh, and, and all of that will in turn feed rational nationalist demands for being tough on crime by blocking immigrants or, or imposing curfews in so-called no-go zones where m many of these people live, underclass areas and all of these things. And Manx realized that. He said that, you know, during, because he, he was that conscious. So he said to me that he felt like he was a Kapellmeister directing an orchestra. He knew exactly what killing a Muslim person or an African, uh, Afro-Swedish person would accomplish. Those who do not understand that are the police, the media, common people who were played like briquettes in his play, you know, and, and the leaderless resistance ta tactics, that's all over. The fascists already knew this, this tactic. It's descri described in novels, in handbooks, it's out there on the internet. They go out with very detailed descriptions of how you should behave if you enter the underground of, of uh, lone wolves and, and uh, leaderless resistance tactics. Uh, and we need, to we need to understand that. So I think that even without my book, those texts will be out there. People will be out, will be out killing anyway. But we need to understand who we, who, you know, what we are confronting. All very interesting points. Alarming, I would say, as well. <laughs> um, now we would be able to open up to some questions from the audience. And I believe there is also a microphone available to go around. So I would open up. And maybe you could just say your name and also who your question is directed towards. I see one in the way back. 
or was there someone here too? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Hello. Ah, yeah, cool. Um, I'm Gabriel, and uh, I have uh, one short and one longer question. The first short question is to Janis Janša. I, I didn't quite get it. Are there now two Janis Janšas in the uh, parliament? And um, the, the second question is uh, directed to, to all of you, and I wanted to ask what... Um, what kind of public scandal or what kind of behavior um, does still take people down in a way? And how big is the difference between the um, like center, far right and far left parties? So are there different scandals that take down left politicians uh, than, than they do right politicians? You understood that? So. First of all, are there really several Yannis Janssens in Parliament? <laughs> and then also, what do you have to do these days to get in trouble <laughs> in the far right? Is there anything? Uh, so there is only one Yannis Janssens in the Parliament, and that's not uh, neither of uh, three of us, yeah? <clears throat> but the other Yannis Janssens. Despite the fact that uh, um, SDS won uh, the elections with uh, quite huge margin, the second biggest uh, result was 13%, they will not uh, run the government uh, because uh, uh, they couldn't create a coalition. I don't think that would be able to get them into trouble because uh, every scandal would be regarded as fake news. They would uh, consider this kind, of, um, this kind of conference as a scandal because we do not talk about Muslim migration, we do not talk about the Islamic terrorists, we do not talk about the stabbings and the murders which you can read in every newspaper every day. This would be the answer. I think we can be uh, couldn't uh, believe that there will be a scandal and everything is thrown away in the right-wing movement. I don't think it would work in that way. I think you can actually get in trouble. If you are a local radical nationalist party members that uh, criticize the leadership, they could use whatever kind of scandal to get rid of you. So, for instance, in, in uh, the Sweden Democrats have imposed what they call a zero tolerance policy against racism, which is hilarious for such a party, right? And it's used to, to get rid of internal opponents. Uh, but it's not effectuated if, you know, the scandal is... If they expose some of the more leading figures, those in the faction currently in power, that they also have roots or go under pseudonyms and participate in, in National Socialist debate forums, that's not a scandal. So, so it, in a way, don't be a vocal critic of the leadership if you're a party member of a National Socialist Party. Hi. Um, I wanted to ask something to Matthias because uh, um, I am interested in understanding a bit better your methodology of, of participatory obser observation of the Wallraff, uh, uh, I mean, not really the Wallraff because you are open um, with your name and so on, but uh, uh, I was wondering uh, how do you actually apply that? I mean, you say that you have been for a long time uh, observing these people uh, but I also know that as a background you are uh, uh, pretty interested in activism, we have been also a lot of activist uh, things, so how could be uh, so close to them by maintaining this distance as a researcher without really trying to provoke any change in their minds? I mean, how did you, uh, that, did you deal with this problem of being outside and inside a kind of phenomenon because you were with them. Mm, uh, thank you for your question. Well, that's also a multi-layered question. But, but I choose not to Waldraff, so I do not infiltrate. I want to state that clearly. I'm very out, you know, upfront with who, whom I am and where I stand politically. 
And that has been very good, because this world is absolutely paranoid. It's infiltrated by so many police officers and federal agents and anti-racist uh, <laughs> observers or whatnot. So this sense of paranoia is always there. And, and today it's not possible really for a person like me to try to valraf. So it's much easier to be upfront and honest. L and it's difficult right now. I don't know to the extent I will, will succeed in talking to all the people in the Swedish radical nationalist landscape as I'm defined as a race traitor and whom, you know, a person who should be killed. And I receive my, my share of death threats. But today they, they come by mail, right? So, so you get the mail saying that you will die. And I can answer, thank you, Mr. X, for your, for your information. That's one of the few things I already knew. Um, but but, but um, one day we will all die, and all the other days we will not, right? Um, so, so why don't we meet, and you can have a chance to elaborate on, on this or that that he was writing about. And, and, and uh, in quite many occasions we actually do meet. And also now with the current leadership, I, I you know, on tape, because I use tape interviews, uh, explicitly state that we, we come from you know, di diametrically opposed political uh, milieus. Uh, one day we will perhaps shoot each other, but that day is not today. This day we choose to, to talk to each other, and, and I'm interested in, in learning more about their worldview, so I'm not there trying to change the way they think. Uh, I'm, I'm trying to understand more. So I want them, you know, I normally talk for hours and hours and hours, f five hours, six hours, seven hours, interviews, things like that. And, and, and uh, so that's my approach. I'm not saying that it's, you know, the only approach or anything. It's just an approach that works for me. And it has its, another interesting side is that because of they know that I'm not there as a sympathizer, I could not be suspected of trying to break away and form my own United Aryan Front or something and compete with them. And that makes them, I, I get a sort of therapeutic role. So, so people could call me because they know I'm, I'm one of the few people whom they know outside the radical nationalist milieu. So if they, for instance, have problems in their love life or feel blue, just want to talk to someone, go and have a beer, they, they would call me and, 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 and confine a lot of these things. And I never publish anything of that. But, but I know for sure a lot of you know, inside information that really makes me understand why there was a split in this party. or uh, it, it could be other reasons. But, 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 but I'm quite honest. And also I would say that I always offer them a, a copy of the interview. I you know, offer them to read in advance whatever I will publish about them, not only the quotations, but also the context. And I also consider if they do not agree with the analysis, why not put in their objections to the analysis in the end notes to give the reader another dimension and form their minds. You're kind of dear Abby for white nationalists. <laughs> so, <laughs> do we have other questions? There's one uh, right there, and then one in the back. Who has a microphone? Yeah. I'd like to sit in on one of these uh, meetings where they're talking about their relationship problems. <laughs> I just can't imagine. <laughs> um, hi, my name is Alina, and ideally, I'd like all three of you to answer my question. Um, I feel like throughout this talk and the previous talk, very often there's been a link established between hatred and fear, so as that very often the root of all this hatred we're talking about is fear. And I think that's possibly true in a lot of cases, but from your experiences with the extreme right, I'd yeah, just like to um, hear about your perception, whether you think is that always the case or is there another reason? The link between hatred and fear. Any of you? We keep using this one. This is the one here. Just tell the story. Um, no, no, I think that fear, of course, has something to do with it. But I think other feelings too. 
Uh, I think that the feeling of being entitled for being white, that there is certain birthright privileges that now is being denied, you know, I'm denied that. So they suffer from a sort of aggrieved, uh, a sense of aggrieved entitlement. They should have a, a, a more, you know, a better life. And it's also interesting that this, if, if, if you look at where they are coming from in terms of class or socioeconomic status, they are not, they're not from the bottom of the underclass. They come from the skilled working class and the lower middle class. They're not especially poor. They're not doing badly. They're predominantly from, from quite decent heterosexual families with ordinary, you know. Uh, but, but they still, still sort of feel a sort of relative deprivation. They, they sense that they are losing ground. They sense that there are so many blacks and Asians and Muslims and Jewish people and others that are celebrated in their place. And, and they, interestingly enough, think that the, uh, the history, uh, the, the few, they have a very negative view on where history is going. For instance, Sweden right now prosper economically. We gained a, a lot from, from immigration before we sealed the borders. You know, it's booming. It's people are well off. Unemployment is down, even though that's very unequally distributed. So, so if you're black, if you have a Muslim name, you are less likely to get a job matching your qualifications. You end up in these stigmatized underclass areas. But, but those who would vote for the Sweden Democrats, they're doing quite good. And yet, they're suffering from this aggrieved entitlement. And they get mad from that. So, of course, they might fear, but I think they also suffer from that. It's not enough, really. It's not enough. Enough. They want to go back to the 50s. They were not even born there. I uh, would like uh, just to add one point. Uh, Right-wing politics is always politics of fear. When you remember at one of the classical analyses of uh, right-wing populism in the early 50s and 60s in the uh, USA, Richard Hofstetter called his essay the paranoid style in American politics. And there are still paranoid styles all over Europe now at the moment, for example. And this politics of fear is also caused by the official rhetoric of the German government now at the moment. Look at uh, Horst Seehofer, uh, who, to who told us yesterday that migration is the mother of all problems. That's politics of fear, of course. I, I, I just had to add, uh, but it's also politics of glory, of pride, of patriotism, of national greatness, of a lot of things that goes on in the mainstream. So it connects also to that. So, so, so I think you should kick in a lot of these emotions, not only fear. Yeah, and Horst Seehofer is not afraid of anything except for losing votes to the AFD. So do we have uh, one in the back? Yeah, my, this my is the quest last question, by the way, guys, I think. Oh. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> so yeah, uh, my question uh, is a little bit similar because I, I'm, I wanted to ask you like, where do you see these fears? Like, where are they talked about? Like, because what I see a lot put out by media is, uh, yeah, we are against Nazi people and they should like go away, but where is questioning like, okay, so what's your fear and uh, where is that talked about? Do you see something like in the, like to ask like, so what's the problem really of your fear? Is it the migrant or what is it? You mean like what's really behind what they fear? Do they actually really fear migrants or is there yeah, something? Where, where in the media or where in the politics is there a discussing, uh, uh, thinking about what's really the, the, the problem? Or is there really a problem? <laughs> oh, okay, these are now books and books uh, that need to answer this uh, question, but <clears throat> um, I don't know. I mean, um, um, there is big difference between, uh, uh, let's say, urban and uh, non-urban. Uh, 
uh, areas uh, where the, 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 the society is basically uh, structured in a very different way. And if we, are, if we live in, uh, in, uh, in, in urban uh, context, uh, maybe we don't see this uh, 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 dimension of uh, uh, fear. So people don't want to expose themselves or people don't want to stand what, what they really uh, feel and think. Uh, and rather stay at home uh, protecting uh, their little uh, comfort they think they have. Uh, and and uh, right wing is much stronger, of course, in uh, less urban uh, context where uh, uh, the public space is much easy to control, to centralize. Uh, and uh, um, <clears throat> I think uh, Daryl was talking uh, a lot uh, uh, about this, and maybe one connection uh, related also to, uh, um, to your question is that actually when you uh, talk with, I don't know, members of SDS and so on, uh, uh, they are like people like uh, everyday people, yeah, or what was the term that, uh, that you uh, use, yeah? but there are two uh, clear lines. Yeah? There are two clear lines. Uh, and one are uh, uh, immigrants, yeah? foreigners, uh, a figure of foreigner, uh, which today is mostly a portrait in the figure of immigrant, and the other one is the other. Yeah? All that is not uh, like uh, uh, like we are. And it's a kind of unsurmountable uh, 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 taboo that Daryl also uh, portrayed. Yeah, I'm talking with you, I understand what you are saying, you are right, but you will not change uh, 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 my opinion. You know? And uh, um, the, 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 the speculation that I would like to bring, and doesn't mean that I'm adv advocating uh, this, and that maybe sometimes uh, causes a lot of problems is maybe uh, on the left side, there should be also some kind of like clear cut uh, line. Maybe the problem that we are discussing uh, 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 today is that left is like totally, became totally tolerant, uh, too much uh, obsessed with the libertarian uh, dimension, the tolerance politics and so on. Um, that um, it's uh, what you were uh, saying before, yeah? that the right wing completely took this social, uh, 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 social uh, dimension. Yeah. I think you asked uh, the main question, um, what do they fear? I remember that a friend of mine who is a representative in the parliament of Saxonia went to the first Pegida demonstration. There were more than 10,000 people and she would like to ask the people why they're here, why they're taking part at this kind of public protest and they told them we have almost no Muslims here in Saxonia. So why are demonstrating just here against the Islamization of the West? It doesn't make sense. And uh, they told her that they're just not fearing Islamization. Islamization is a shiver for the development and the changes in our government. They were talking about unisex toilets. They were talking of, uh, about gay rights. They were talking against Conchita Wurst. So uh, this was the main enemy image now at this evening on 2040. And I think we have to guard as a main narrative since more than 20 years. I can recommend you an old Cracker episode, which was released in 1994, where a Hillsbury survivor told to the police that he had always been oppressed by minorities, by the police, by the public will, and now he is against it. He sees a world as a white male, which is not longer white and which is not by longer dominated by males. And I think we have to guard this point also, this kind of bashing of libertarian movements, for example. This is not just the case in the electoral uh, campaign of Donald Trump. 
we, it's, it's uh, almost vivid since 1968. So uh, my approach to say the last thing is mainly inspired by Stuart Hall. Stuart Hall um, published an essay 1979 which was called The Great Moving Right Show in a paper which was called Marxism Today which was highly influential in the British discourse these days. And he um, said one thing which I think will be very productive if he used this approach also. You know, when you are being trained at leftist meetings, there was always someone who claims themselves to be the avant-garde of the working class and says, this is false consciousness. The working class has a false consciousness. It's been employed. And Stuart Hall says, that's not my approach. I'm not interested in what is false in the consciousness. I'm interested in what is right in the false consciousness. Why do so many people think that the mainstream media just offer them fake news, just offer them preaches about tolerance, about the changes of our government, about women's rights and minority programs like that and their kind of view? So I think we have to regard what is true in this kind of false consciousness. Because I think what we can see now, even in the apparatus of the government now in Germany the last days, the president of the security service, Maaßen, against the uh, speaker of Chancellor Merkel, this is a hegemonical crisis we are running through now in Germany. And these true elements of the false consciousness are trying to become the public will of the main parts of our political sphere. And that just not par in the eastern part of Germany. You can find it also in Baden-Württemberg, for example, and in Rheinland-Pfalz. I mostly work for the labor unions. Many of our members have voted for the AFD. Like one third of the British working class did 1979. They voted for Thatcher. So that's the, these are the things that we have to regard. This politics of fear, and this fear is not just based on the fear on Islamophobia, for example. Uh, still, still work. What? I don't know if I can be quick. I talk too much all the time. Um, okay, so let's talk about fear and tolerance. Uh, so, I, so I think fear has to do with it. For instance, if you look at where, where are the, the radical nationalist parties strongest in Sweden, you will find that they are strongest in parts of Sweden where they have no or few people with non-European migrant background. Islamophobia or anti-Muslim racism is strongest in sections in Sweden where you have few or no Muslim people. But they are fed all kinds of, of, of uh, talk about these people whom they do not know. Uh, do you know, uh, do you heard the stories about no-go zones in Sweden? Is that story here? Do you know that they don't exist? Uh, what? Hey, it's, it's, it's just, you know, it's, it's, it's absolutely ridiculous. It's home to a lot of people. There are no no-go zones for people looking like me. And obviously not for the journalists who go there to make the reports. Uh, but there are other kinds of no-go zones in Sweden, of course. If you are black, if you are Muslim, you know that you cannot walk in certain districts uh, without being endangered for hate crime or anything like that. But no-go zones don't exist. But in the minds of those who live in districts where there are no Muslims or non-European migrants, it might be as scary to, to look at these news as they are scary for people outside of Sweden with no personal experience of that. And I think that some males also, f you know, when they feel entitled to certain respect and status only because they are white and men, uh, they, they, they fear gender studies. That's why they want to go out and, you know, forbid gender studies at the universities because gender studies is part of the ongoing process of the feminization of the Western man, the emasculation and all of that. So they want to, to you know, regain their, their, their masculinity. And, and one way of doing that, of course, is to be very heavily radical nationalist and fascist because that's a serious way of expressing or articulating masculinity. And I think that the problem of talking about only fear and, and those things is connected to the idea of tolerance. And, and, and 
at least in Sweden, you know, the, the, the left uh, as su super tolerant is not, has not been that tolerant, really. But, 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 but uh, I think that's a problem because when you talk about racism as tolerance, you outsource what is really a political problem to a problem of certain deviant individuals who have wrong moral or, or individual ethics. Racism is really a technology in the sense of, of how we do things here that produces the folks that probably belong to the na nation is en en entitled to wealth and status and privileges and uh, combined then with a system of unequal distribution uh, of, of uh, status, wealth, privileges um, along certain imagined groups position between the pools of worthy and unworthy human life. That, I think that's racism. Racism uh, is a technology, it's a system, it has really not that much to do with individual ethics. And when you think in terms of tolerance, that sort of invite, okay, so if the problem is intolerance, like when they expose, okay, there are racism in the police force, what a shock, it, you know, it gets exposed again and again and again. And then the police react by inviting um, experts on tolerance and diversity. And they would then invite a black person or a Muslim person who sits, sits next to the police officer. They might even touch each other to get to know each other. And, and then, you know, it, it's absolutely ridiculous. I, I would say that, that there is no really by principle, difference between the tolerant and the intolerant. Both sort of things that he, it's all often a he, has the right to be the manager of, of this public space and define, you know, they differ in terms of what would be the rules for allowing people inside this space, how should they behave, how should they greet each other, how, you know, how could they live, but they both think that they are entitled to ma being the manager of the public space, of the proper folk who belong here and set up rules to those who do not belong to the proper folk, how they should go enter, how many should they be, and you know, all of these things. And should you fight racism, you need to give up on, on the position of, of being the manager. Well, I'll take on the role of manager one more time, just to say that we have to wrap it up now. And I want to thank the three of you for this panel. I don't know about the rest of you, but I went through the whole range of human emotions listening to this. I was scared, I was disgusted. I was angry and I was uh, laughing a lot as well. So I hope that the rest of you also enjoyed it. And I would just say, let's have a round of applause for our speakers. Uh, I also wanted really to thank you a lot, uh, uh, both for the moderation and the great presentations. And I just want to steal uh, two minutes for announcing that uh, tomorrow we will have another part of the conference. Uh, and we start at uh, uh, 4.30 with the um, presentation transgression then and now. We will have uh, Florian Kramer and Stuart Holm that we will speak about uh, uh, if the alt-right reenact counterculture. Um, and then we have a panel about infiltration uh, in which we will go on discussing the discourse of in infiltration with Patrick Emerson, Julia Ebner, and also Christo Christopher Schiano and Hartsacker. And uh, so also answering to your question, yes, there is also a woman that infiltrated and tomorrow will speak with us. And I think it was really good the connection that you did with the identitarian movement because she has been really working on that. So tomorrow we could also hear about her. And then I want to um, go on by saying that we have also a, a collaboration with the York Kino Group. Um, and it uh, was really interesting because at the moment in the cinema there is the film Black Clansman and they were really interested 
on our conference, uh, the York Aquino Group, uh, because we invited Daryl Davis. So uh, they thought that uh, our conference, in the sense, was really linking interestingly with their film, even if it's a really different story. But uh, this story is about the infiltration of the Ku Klux Klan uh, from uh, a black uh, uh, policeman of the Colorado Police Department. Uh, and um, so, uh, in a sense, they have been also helping us promoting this conference uh, because they thought that we had a great uh, uh, true story uh, of course, not of a policeman, <laughs> but uh, something that uh, could speak in, in a different way about uh, the Ku Klux Klan and the idea of uh, trying to understand what they are doing and so on. And uh, then I also want to conclude by saying that we are going to show another film uh, on Sunday. will be at Spectrum with Daryl Davis. Is the film in which he's the protagonist. It's called Accidental Courtesy is directed by Matthew Orstein, and uh, uh, Daryl will be with us again. He will play the piano, so we are really happy because he's a professional musician, so he has been really kind also to say that he wants to show us this part of his expertise. Then we will show the film, and we will have at the end question and answer together with Daryl again. And this will be on Sunday at Spectrum, that is also our partner since a long time. So uh, I just want to conclude and also thank again Daryl Davis uh, from the first part uh, and Anna Muller and all the great speakers that we had today. And uh, yeah, Tina already thanks her, but I, I do again. <laughs> yes. Uh, and thank, of course, to all the public. And we meet tomorrow again at 4.30. So we are starting half an hour before then today. Please remember that. And thank you very much. And thanks also to all the people that have been working with us. I'm going to list them tomorrow one by one. But I think now we are all tired. And let's go to relax. Thank you. <laughs>